Our guest today is an amazing individual, Daniel Smith. This young man was inadvertently put into the position of having to stand up for all of our rights to use alternative health remedies. A humble family man working to provide for his wife and daughter, several years ago, he, along with his loved ones, were suddenly thrust into a nightmare involving armed raids, confiscation of property, and confinement. Now he's on trial, facing severe punishments, which could include up to 37 years in prison. This is important to us all because his fate in the upcoming trial will affect the health freedom of all individuals throughout the planet, as it could limit valid cures for illnesses. Illnesses that the pharmaceutical cartel doesn't want cured. Illnesses that could destroy their business models for such profitable illnesses as cancer, malaria, or various types of hemorrhagic fever. Welcome to another edition of The World Beyond Belief, the third in our interview series, and today we have two very special guests with us. I am your co-host, Mindy Erkin, and with me, as always, is your host, Paul Marco. Hi, nice to be here. And with us today, we have Daniel Smith and Mia Hamill joining us. And they Hello. have a very special story to tell us. Hello, Daniel. Hello, Mia. Welcome to our Hello. show. Hi, Mindy. Hi, Paul. Hi, Mia. Good to hear from you. It's great to be with you guys again. So either of you, tell us a little bit about the background of, of yourselves and your story so we can all follow along with what's happening. Sure, okay. Well, this is Daniel and Daniel Smith, and we're embroiled in, in a, a battle with the FDA, which technically it's really with the Department of Justice at this time. The, you know, the FDA sort of kicks it off and then hands it off to a U.S. attorney, so it's all the same. And uh, this has been going on since, well, it's, it first started in 2010, but the um, an indictment was, was handed down in 2013, and this uh, has to do with uh, our company, um, which was then a, a private association, uh, Project Green Life, and, and the involvement with uh, MMS, also known as uh, Miracle Mineral Solution, or Master Mineral Solution, as is known now. So uh, that's, I don't really know where to go from there, but uh, that's kind of what we're involved in right now. Well, Daniel, will you tell the listeners, please, what is the MMS product? Because I'm sure we have a lot of listeners who really aren't aware of what that is. Oh, okay, sure. So, uh, MMS, uh, great story. I'll, I'll, I'll go back if I can just a little bit. Um, we, we learned about MMS in 2007, I believe it was, when we read a book by Jim Humble, which I think was then called... Uh, the Miracle Mineral Supplement of the 21st Century, something to that effect. And in fact, Jim Humble was uh, sort of a metallurgist miner guy. The way he discovered this, he was in South America many years prior, and he had a mining team. They were probably 80 miles into the jungle, and a long ways, as, as you, you know from, from where you're at, that... Uh, you know, it can be a drive to get somewhere where you need to be for, for medical attention. And they had some, some people in their team come down with malaria. And uh, they were sort of incapacitated. They couldn't really hike out. Uh, they didn't, you know, they weren't in any shape to do that. And Jim had brought along with him some product that uh, was used for purifying water, which was a, basically a sodium chloride solution. And he figured, well, if this works for... Uh, you know, to purify water, you know, why not um, give it to these guys and see if it'll work for that? And um, so we did, and I, I think it was just a matter of hours, and they, they were back on their feet again. And so that sort of set Jim on an entirely uh, new trajectory in his life, uh, and he spent uh, several years after that trying to figure out what had happened, why you know, malaria kills uh, upwards of a million people every year. We don't hear about it much in, in the Western world, but 
you know, it's it's a it's a big deal in the world. And so, why do we have something that's so simple and yet so effective, but uh, it's it's not being shared with with the people who need it? So he he went to work trying to figure out what was going on with that, and came to a conclusion that sodium chloride was generating chlorine dioxide when it was activated by the acids in the stomach. And so he developed a, a protocol to uh, sort of activate acid of, acid of, well, to sodium chloride to activate it outside the body and for people to use. So he went uh, to, I think it was Malawi, right? Malawi? Malawi. And did some case studies there and had um, doctors administrate it to uh, you know, folks there and, and children who had malaria. And had great results, and over time, uh, people started using it for other things and reporting, uh, you know, amazing things. Now, so sodium chloride, uh, well, we should say uh, chlorine dioxide, sodium chloride is effective to kill all kinds of pathogens: your yeast, mold, fungus, bacteria. It's fact. It's uh, the government's actually using it now to get rid of Ebola, N- not necessarily internally, but to disinfect you know, uh, areas where Ebola may have been or, or, and so forth. And so, um, very effective pathogen killer. And it turned out that it was very effective uh, in killing the protozoa uh, malaria and other things. And so, that developed into the book that, that we eventually read and what has really become a worldwide movement of people who are using MMS to disinfect water both internally and externally and to a great benefit to their their health. I encountered MMS in my travels in South America several years ago and I understood that it was treating even you know the the common cold and flu symptoms and has has so many uses and very easily done at, at, at very little expense, too. So what a gift to the population to be able to have something like this. Mindy, you know that I worked with Jim Humble for a while, and uh, I used to get the emails that were sent to him, and I was amazed at the emails that came in because uh, the, the range of things that people were getting well from, was it was just out of sight. Literally, they're getting well from things like diabetes, cataracts, psoriasis, chronic pain. Um, They were expelling parasites, skin cancers, and then you had the serious ones. Cancer, you know, taking people with hep C down to zero viral load, taking people with HIV AIDS down to undetectable viral loads. It was such an eye-opener. you know, I'm not saying that it works 100% of the time, but then nothing does. But the important thing that I learned from all of this is that uh, MMS is an oxidizing disinfectant in the same class as hydrogen peroxide and ozone. If you look at the history of ozone and hydrogen peroxide, they, they too have been suppressed. Otherwise, we'd be using hydrogen peroxide and ozone, and people would understand better the mechanism of MMS. But they're all oxidizing and uh, disinfectants, and, and really, we need to disinfect ourselves. And so what I really picked up from all of this is that if a person finds a way to do a general body disinfection of his bloodstream, I mean, these are the ones that will uh, run through your blood. Of course, your blood nourishes every organ in your body, so it's a really good start on improving your health. To, um, to take some product that's effective wide spectrum. You know, we've heard wide spectrum. The main pathogens the human body is going to get is viruses, bacteria, molds, and parasites. Then, of course, you have problems with things like heavy metals or radiation. Um, and it turns out that MMS influences all of those things. Literally, I can name uh, instances where I heard about getting rid of parasites, getting rid of molds, getting rid of uh, um, bacteria, and getting rid of viruses, as well as Jim says that it helps people get rid of heavy metals. So um, 
we don't really say that it treats a disease or, or even cures a disease. All it does is it, it kills pathogens. It just turns out that a large uh, a number of, of disease conditions and symptoms, uh, you know, known to man are, are caused by pathogens. Yeah, you've got toxicities, you've got pathogens, and MMS is part of the road to getting rid of those two things. So it sounds like a product that is well needed. And so, so you read this book by Jim Humble, and then wh where did it go from there? Well, we had a um, sort of a vision of starting Project Green Life uh, for several years. That kind of came about, um, the idea came about when um, my mother passed. She was in the hospital, and they weren't giving her very good nutrition, and I was questioning her the doctor about it and, and he said you know I'm a medical doctor I eat Twinkies and drink Coca-Cola I know nothing about nutrition and of course um, that was you know about 12 years ago and I just it just stunned me I thought I'm talking to a medical doctor who has the life of my uh, mother in his hands and he just told me he knows nothing about nutrition and uh, you know <laughs> just just flew in the face of everything so, so we sort of um, and I say we um, uh, my uh, partner, wife, uh, at the, her name is Karis, and she doesn't show up much here in the conversation because um, it's just it's just hard to bring family into everything. But um, at the time, she she's also under under indictment. So we created Project Green Life to pursue an idea that you know if if every cell in the human body regenerates over so much time, what would happen if we gave our body um, only the, the, the finest cell food you, you could give it. You know, what, what if you, you know, what, what could happen in a seven, like they say seven years is about what it takes for every cell because, you know, the rods and cones of the eyes take a little longer, you know, than, than the liver and so forth. There are, it would be shorter, actually, if it wasn't for a couple of those items in our body. But if, if we could give our body everything it needed in, in, in such optimum um, ways what what would be the end result because we you know we take in so much garbage and everything is so toxic around us our environments and 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 that sort of came uh into the idea of project green life and so when when we read jim's book it sort of uh became the um the driving force to 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 plunge into that idea that we'd had for a long time and that was in 2007 so we, we sold MMS and slowly we added different products uh, to the, um, sorry, my phone rang there. Um, we we, we uh, added various products. We carried up to about 100 and so products. Um, <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> no worries. Uh -huh. <laughs> entertaining. Very entertaining. <laughs> um, the, uh, once, it, once it left my phone, it came to my computer. So... Uh, we uh, added some products, and we were we we're going along smoothly. And, and these were alternative um, health products, not your typical vitamins and minerals or anything like that. And so we, in about 2010, um, the FDA shows up unannounced at our fulfillment company, and it wasn't our fulfillment company; it was a third-party fulfillment company. And um, they're uh, they're armed. They're um, we should say pretty pretty bossy. They use the the line from the the TV shows. We can do this the easy way, the hard way, and they go in and and just terrorize the poor employees of that company for three days straight. They do a plant map where they take a photo of every product, every label, every page of every book because they can't take anything with them. They don't have a warrant to seize anything, and so. Um, and they just do it under under regulation where they say, well, if you're selling any uh, supplements, well, then we get to come in and, and, and check you out anytime we want. And so, um, the, you know, of course, anyway, long story. But uh, no, they terrorized them, and uh, I got a hold of an attorney down in Nevada who called them up and said, hey, what's going on? You know, we've never received any letters or any communications from the FDA. Long story short, they say, we don't like your product MMS. And uh, 
that's when uh, my attorney at that time says, look, you know, I've dealt with the FDA plenty of times. You don't want to deal with them. They're, they're a, a terrorizing agency, um, and they will make your life miserable, and you don't want to deal with it. So what I suggest is that you do a voluntary recall of your product. And I thought about that um, no more than 24 hours, and, and so we affected the recall. Um, because I have a family and, you know, it was, it was pretty scary at the time. So we did the recall and, um, then, uh, we shortly thereafter became acquainted with a organization down in Texas called the Pro Advocate Group who, who said, basically, you have a constitutional exemption to operate as a private association, even, even conducting commerce within that association. Um, outside of, of federal regulation. And I thought, well, okay, that sounds pretty good. Tell me more. And, and, and they said, well, we've got 300 members, and including a pra- you know, practitioners, uh, health practitioners, uh, doctors, and naturopaths who have dropped their state licenses and are, and are now just operating under the private association clause. And um, th- about 300 of them all around the nation, I think, is the number they cited. And, and they said, well, we, and we've never lost a case. And Etc. So on, and, and so I said, "Well, do you have anyone that's ever been in a situation like ours, where, um, you know, you've you've got an F- FDA agency that's come in, they've you know they've threatened you, um, and and then they went pri- you know the whoever it was went private, and, and the FDA went away and said, yes, you need to call Doctor Overman from Precision Herbs. Not a, don't know if you're familiar with with him." But I, I called Dr. Overman, and I said, okay, um, tell me a story. He said, oh, yep, they were here for 10 days. They had their guns drawn. They were, they were you know, just terrorizing all the employees. They were, gonna, they were bragging about how they were going to press criminal charges and, and doing the same thing, plant maps and photos and, and, and just, you know, interrogating and so forth. And um, Dr. Overman said, well, we, and then we went to the Pro Advocate Group. They gave us seven letters. They helped us reorganize as a private association. We sent the seven letters to the FDA, and we never heard from them again. And, and they were scheduled to come back, in fact. And so I thought, well, that, that sounds really good. So um, I contacted someone else who was in the MMS um, uh, manufacturing business who had also gone with this company and gone private, sent the FDA the same, same letters, they never contacted him, and I thought, well, this is great. So I looked at all the case law, this, you know, and I, you know, I'm not an attorney, but um, you know, the the explanation of the case law all seemed very plausible to me, and um, and so the pro advocate group reorganized uh, us as a private association. They gave us the seven letters. We sent them to the FDA, and lo and behold, we never heard from them again. And basically, what it essentially said was, look, here's the case law. Here's what we're relying on. These are U.S. Supreme Court cases. Um, so uh, do you have any legal valid objection? Because we're going to do this unless you do. If you, don't, if, I mean, if you have a legal valid objection, we're not going to do this. But um, if you, we, we know that the FDA and these other agencies, they don't, they don't answer if they don't want to answer. So we're like, look, you, you have to answer. And if you don't answer, we're going to presume that you don't have a legal valid objection. Um, so uh, they did not answer. And we, so we felt after talking to everyone that, wow, we had, we had definitely um, shielded, us, shielded ourselves from the, the, the federal oversight um, FDA that they had gone away. Um, and so we spent another year, and every person that purchased MMS from us at that time was, they came in as a private member. Well, during that time, the FDA sent in undercover. Um, some people to sign the private contract and and purchase the product. Now, I'm just I'm just kind of like stream of consciousness here, so stop me anytime. Just, I just wanted to give you an example of of the private association argument. There are still um, uh, counties in Texas, for example. This was the example that was given to us that are still dry from the the probation uh, the, the prohibition era, and. You, that, which means you can't sell alcohol in those counties. Mm-hmm. Well, the way they get around that is that you can go into what's called a private club and you sign the contract and you become a private member and now they can sell it to you. 
because it's in the private, it's not in the public anymore. And remember, the FDA is charged with protecting the, the uh, health of the public, not the private. So that's just one example. So skipping back, going back into to the story we were at, we, we operated for another year. They had sent the FDA agents. They made controlled purchases. Um, that's what they're referred to in discovery is the controlled buys. They signed the contract. The contract said we are not federal agents seeking to regulate. We're, you know, we're buying this in our private capacity for private use, so forth. So they essentially lied. Mm -hmm. And um, so then they purchased the product. And it would be about a year later that they, sh you know, I don't know, 12 to 15 agents show up at three different locations on the same day. They flew in from all over the United States to conduct their stormtrooper raid on our home, uh, the bottling facility, and the shipping facility. And they just came in and they just took everything, like computers, all the product, uh, bottling equipment, records, mail, even unopened mail. Uh, they just they swooped it all up and, and took it with them. Uh, on and what they had been doing for that entire year that we we believed that we were operating, um, you know, legally and under the constitutional exemption that we'd been shown, um, what they were doing was they were sneaking around our house, taking photographs, uh, you know, putting warrantless GPS tracking devices on our vehicles, um, going through our garbage. We, we've got pictures of, of them going through our garbage and discovery. It, it's it very, very... Um, intrusive. Yeah, very intrusive. And so um, they uh, used all this data they were collecting sort of, uh, it was really sort of malicious because they could have just answered us and said, yeah, we have a, a valid objection or legal valid objection or, or we believe that um, the case law that you're citing w is, is inapplicable for this reason or whatever. They could have provided us some feedback, but they didn't. Instead, they went into full undercover, uh, you know, secret, um, you know, agent, you know, yeah. it, it, it just, it, you know, basically with the, with the intent of burying us. They wanted to collect enough data, take it to a magistrate, say, see these guys, they're breaking the law, give us warrants, let us go in, we'll go wipe out all their bank accounts, all their, take all their computers, their equipment, their product, we'll put them out of business. And then we're going to take and use that evidence that we collect to create, you know, a real case against them, even though they didn't really have a case, at, you know, certainly not at the time. And so it would be another uh, almost two years and at least three, maybe four grand juries, not separate, not necessarily grand, there was at least two separate grand juries um, where they, uh, they would they would bring in witnesses and, and to the grand jury and so forth uh, to get an indictment. But it would be about two years before they returned the indictment. And during this time, um, they kept all of our, our money, all of our product. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> it's, it's been a, it's been a long journey, a nightmare. And, uh, you have any questions? <laughs> yeah, so you were so you were basically out of business. They put you totally out of business. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Took yeah. all the product and intimidated you. I mean, it sounds like an horribly intimidating process with armed gunmen coming into your house. Yeah, in fact, uh, Karis um, was diagnosed with PTSD sh shortly after the raid on the home. Mm. It was uh, so terrorizing to her that she told me I will not I will not go back to that house she would never go back to that house because you don't know if, 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 if they're not going to give you any fair warning whatsoever and actually lie to you and make you believe that you're fine you're okay you're operating within the law you don't know when they're going to come next and, and thankfully when they came to the home I was in New Mexico taking my daughter to uh, a yearly yoga camp there and uh, so my, my daughter didn't have to go through that particular raid, um, but, and Karis was al alone. But it was so traumatic, mm -hmm. she said, I'll never go back to that house again. And we didn't. Um, and then uh, uh, Karis, uh, well, I should say, um, 
in 2013 when we were arrested, they they just came to our home early morning. Uh, uh, we were in Ashland, Oregon. We had recently moved there to enroll our daughter in the Waldorf School there because Karis just um, just so much stress. She she wasn't interested in homeschooling anymore. We wanted to put Savvy in a, in a good school. So we, we researched and we, we felt like Ashland was where we wanted to go. So we're there in Ashland um, and we uh, were getting Savvy up for school one morning and they come barging into our home and they arrest mom and dad right in front of our daughter. It's very, uh, very difficult. Mm-hmm. And um, I don't know if you read on the site the story, but they held us in, in jail for a month transported us from Oregon to Washington and uh, Sabby, um, you know, she didn't know if she was going to see her mom and dad ever again. It would be a month before she did. And uh, well, so we've been fighting ever since. Daniel, what were the charges? Uh, can they can they arrest you and lock you up without? Yeah, they had returned an indictment in January, finally. And the indictment alleges four counts of the introduction of an unapproved drug into interstate commerce that was misbranded. See, and I'll I'll just make a clarification here. It's actually not against the law to introduce into interstate commerce a drug. Um, What happens is they will, uh, the FDA says, look, if you you make any health claim about a product, then it becomes classified as a drug unless it's a supplement. Um, and that's a, that's a whole other animal. But um, if they say, well, you, if you say that this uh, is used to cure or mitigate or treat a disease, then it's classified as a drug. And the way we determine that is by looking at your marketing material, all the stuff we came in your house and we stole from you and, and, and you know, all the emails that we got. They got seven years of emails from Google which they were only supposed to get a small window, but they just got it all they just got from the beginning to the end and, and searched it all. Um, complete violation of constitutional rights. And um, they, they say, well, if we can classify it as a drug, then it comes in underneath our regulation. And at that point, what they start doing is they have all of these little tiny nuances and, and, and rules uh, under these or regulations that you as a lay person would never uh would never know you would never know that you 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 would be violating one of these and and so they said that it was it was misbranded well how did they say it was misbranded they said that uh, the label did not bear the name and location of the manufacturer well interesting enough when you look up the law it says it has to bear the name of the manufacturer packer distributor and it did bear the name and location of the distributor so we're not sure how they even got an indictment on that unless the the prosecutor intentionally misled the the grand jury about what the actual law was the second aspect that they say it was misled misbranded was that it wasn't they say it wasn't manufactured in a facility registered with the secretary of health well it was manufactured in a facility registered with the secretary of health it's just that they weren't registered as a drug a pharmaceutical drug manufacturer they were uh, they were actually a nutraceutical company, and um, which which is uh, um, you know GM was GMP compliant and everything, and so they they sort of twist these these rules uh, to come after you. So now that they've said, well, it's a drug, they're saying, well, when you import, say, raw sodium chloride, which we 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 had sodium chloride that came from Canada, they say, well, since um, since you imported this this raw drug ingredient and you get you didn't say that it was a drug in other words you gave it a tariff code that didn't classify it as a drug you were fraudulently importing and so that falls under smuggling so they say well okay so we got four counts of misbranding these are controlled buys predominantly and then they have the smuggling charge and then they add on to that they say you conspired to do all that you conspired to misbrand you conspired to smuggle and you conspired to defraud the FDA thereby. So uh, all of that adds up to a 37 maximum year sentence. And what they did was they charged four people with all of that same stuff, um, including uh, my wife, Karis. They charged uh, um, 
a customer support person for her company who worked uh, customer support from her home. She had nothing to do with the business or any business decisions. Um, and here she's, she's facing 37 years for, for smuggling, misbranding, and a conspiracy. And so what they do is they, um, they bring as much charges against you, and the intent is it, because they're attacking your family and your friends, and um, it, 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 it creates this division um, because they, what they do is they assign everybody their own attorney, and, their own, and then they tell you that you can't talk to each other, so the, the court orders that you can't talk to each other. So, um, of course, I could talk to, to, my, to, to Karis, but uh, you know, I couldn't talk to, to uh, Chris and Tammy, who were also indicted. And so they, they don't allow you to talk. They assign you um, uh, government-paid attorneys who basically have these huge workloads, and, and what they're sort of trained to do is just um, try and extend the case out as long as possible. Um, and, and once it can't be extended out any longer, they go to the, the, to the client and say, you're going to have to plead out, and here's the best offer the government will give you. And because they don't want to face 37 years in prison, they don't want to risk not seeing their family ever again, and they don't want to go to trial where they know the game is rigged, the house has all the, um, you know, the advantage, and the judge is, is clearly biased for the government, um, and, and the, the attorney hasn't done any preparation for trial and is telling them this is the best they're going to get. If they go to trial, they're going to they're be convicted and go to jail. They're forced into taking a plea to swear to doing something they didn't even do. Did, did Karis introduce into interstate commerce a drug that was misbranded? No, she didn't. She didn't have anything to do with the business. But now she's faced in order to save her life and to make sure our daughter doesn't get left without both parents, she has to swear to, to the court that she did something she didn't do. That's the corruption that is behind the, the system uh, you know, that, that all starts with the FDA. I mean, it's, it's everywhere, but it, you know, in this case, it starts with the FDA. It's a divide and conquer strategy, you know, they, they managed to postpone the sentencing on the other co-defendants until after Daniel's trial, so obviously that makes them afraid to testify in Daniel's trial because it could influence their sentencing. It all happens in front of the same judge. Hmm. Sounds, sounds like a horrible um, like mechanism working against you. It sounds like the whole justice system is working in consort with the FDA. Is, it sounds like they're all working together. They are. Oh, yeah. I'll tell you this. The way this whole uh, thing started was back in 2008 or nine. I forget which year it was. The FDA put together, right when they had the H1N1 flu pandemic scare. Hoax you know, scare. You know, yeah. Hoax, the, yes. The, you know, the, the, the newest version of the, the hoax. And um, what they did, the FDA was they put together a task force who that all they did was they swept the Internet night and day looking for anybody who was selling a product on the Internet that said it was effective towards H1N1. And then they went after it. Well, that's how MMS got on the radar. Somebody somewhere had said that H1N1 um, was uh, uh, could be... Uh, mitigated or whatever uh, by the use of MMS. And fr from that day, where, where the FDA put together a task force specifically looking for people to go charge. And if you want to talk about the, the corruption of the system, I'll tell you this. Uh, you know, and this, is, this gets into a little bit of odd law that a lot of people, not even attorneys, are really aware of. But what happens is you have a... a, a you have the government that, or, or, the, or Congress that passes laws, um, codes, and then you have your agencies that, that enforce them. And then when they enforce them, they go to the Department of Justice to have an attorney <clears throat> represent that in a, in a court that's controlled by the U.S. government to take the defendant down. And I think like 
and a half percent of all cases actually plead out. They don't even go to trial. But the chances of winning a trial are so, they, they, it's so rigged. But here's, here's the underlying reason of why. Why this? Why? What's going on? And, and it, it really all comes down to money. What happens when a, a grand jury returns an indictment? It's called a true bill. We pass bills in Congress. We pass, uh, and, and grand juries uh, pass true bills. And why is it a bill? You could say it's a bill because somebody's going to pay. What's on the true bill? Charges. It's charges. What are charges? Those are, those are things where, like if I say, I, I go through a, a, a Starbucks and I say, I would like to order um, you know, a, a cup of coffee. They're going to charge me for a cup of coffee. When I get up there, they're going to give me my coffee. Well, what they've done is they've gotten a, a grand jury to, to establish probable cause that you've ordered up four counts of misbranding, one count of smuggling, and one count of conspiracy, and they've returned a true bill with charges for those. Now they have to prove those charges. So they take that over to the bonk. Um, you've heard of, of judges that sit in bonk. That comes from the Latin. It's the bank. They give it to the clerk of the court who enters these, um, these charges into the court registry investment system, and immediately they begin monetizing these. It's like a, a game of chance. They, they know that there's a certain percentage uh, of cases that they're going to win, and so they start bonding up these cases right away. And we were told, we had somebody actually looked up the QCIP numbers. The QCIP number is the number that's assigned by the um, SCC for uh, uh, instruments that, uh, that, are, that are traded on the market. And uh, this case was valued at one time at over $60 million to the government. So this case makes money for the government. At the end of the day, when they get a conviction, what are they going to do? They're going to warehouse a person as surety for the 20 or 37-year bond that gets written on the case and traded in the market. And this is all very heavily guarded um, you know, top secret, you know, financial um, trading that's really going on. Uh, you've probably heard about how the privatization of, of, of prisons has, has been uh, increasing uh, and, and all the money that's going on. You've probably heard the story uh, recently of the judge that was making millions by sending kids to jail. This is, this is all money that's floating around uh, because of the bonding uh, of these instruments. And so it's, it's so much bigger than the general public really knows. And the, the big picture of that is it's not just you. This is a system that's going to take down anybody that offers up a viable alternative that doesn't go through the drug companies. Right. Well, interesting. I don't know if you're familiar with the Brzezinski uh, story. Um, did, did you see the Brzezinski movie? No. 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 Okay. So you here you have a doctor um, uh, who's who's come up with a very viable, workable, safe, and effective treatment for cancer, and they they pursue this guy to to no end. And while they're pursuing him to try and put him in jail, he's he's down in Texas, to, and and he and he won. But they, I think they, they had nine grand juries. Uh, they would not stop. And the whole time that they're pursuing him, they're secretly filing cop The government, the U.S. government, is secretly filing copycat patents for his uh, treatment, of uh, 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 antineoplasm uh, treatment for, for various cancers. And uh, they're secretly filing these patents. Because, you know, they want Brzezinski in jail, and they want, the government wants to seal up and, and own the technology that is effective and would compete with a system that doesn't make people well from cancer. You know, I mean, we could go on and on about chemotherapy and, and, and you know, how that whole thing is rigged. But um, so, so here's what happened in, in the MMS. In 2013, shortly after we were arrested, Lo and behold, sodium chloride um, received orphan drug status in the European Union. 
Uh, and since then, we've learned that um, there have been clinicals underway for its treatment with Alzheimer's, multiple sclerosis, and Parkinson's. And if you go look online, you'll find that acidified sodium chloride, numerous patents, some based on uh, 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 clinical studies, uh, for the treatment of HIV, uh, dermatologic and inflammatory, uh, inflammatory diseases, in infectious diseases, cancers, diabetic ulcers. There's patents all over the place for it. Um, and so, in, in, you know, on one, one side of their mouth, the FDA is releasing documents to say, hey, this is an industrial bleach, it'll kill you. And, and uh, on the other side of their mouth, um, they know full well that their patent office is receiving and that the, the FDA is receiving results for clinical studies for safe and effective use of chlor uh, sodium chloride uh, for, for numerous uh, uh, health conditions. So, the, we have to know... Can I interject here? That if, if you look at what Daniel's saying, it's that they want to keep uh, small players out of the business. In other words, the reason they were after Brzezinski, they wanted a big pharma company, somebody of theirs, you know, the uh, revolving door. Uh, they wanted to make sure that it's all for the, for the big boys. And so that's what's happening here, too. They're taking something that's not even a drug, and they're getting patents for it. You know, they screw around with it, add this, add that, change a molecule. And so they're able to um, uh, patent uh, this product that should be popularly available. Right, and the, and the force that's driving that is that these pharmaceutical companies are publicly traded companies. And if they don't post profits every quarter, bad things happen. And, and, you know, and so the, we're talking about a sickness industry that really uh, props up a, a failing economy. And so, in, in a sense, you could say the FDA is prote protecting the public interest, but it's not your, your personal health. It's really the health of the economy. Because mm -hmm. if, if pharmaceutical companies fail because a small guy comes in and he can cure whatever disease, uh, you know, for pennies on the dollar, you know, that, that's not good for the economy. So you can see this whole engine is really, it's huge, it's, it's, it's well-oiled, and, and the FDA are sort of, um, they're the mafia with the big stick that goes out and, and, and takes care of business uh, to keep this machine running. And it's been going on for over 100 years now, so much so that several generations of people uh, um, haven't, had any type of exposure to home remedies to natural herbs or anything like that so it's a whole culture that uh has changed from being self-sufficient to being dependent so our medical system has made us dependent on them and at the same time they have no intention of curing us from anything they're putting all their focus in chronic diseases and they're not interested in anything that you can take for instance they're not developing any new antibiotics and they have come out publicly and said we're not interested in that because people take a a one-week course of antibiotics and that's all they take we're not interested in doing that so we here we have mms sitting in the wings that everybody could have and 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 deal with their crisis that would also respond maybe to an antibiotic but they don't want us to have MMS, and they don't want to develop any new antibiotics themselves either. Yeah, they're sort of stuck with that. All the publicly traded corporations have to act in the best interest of their stockholders. Correct. Okay, whatever it takes. So if it's not in the best interest of their stockholders for us to be able to cure cancer, I mean, if you have a cancer drug, then... It's in the best interest of your stockholder to do something to stop those other cures. So it's, it's, it's like right from the beginning, right from the corporations, the charters of the corporations are all publicly traded corporations are all like that. Yeah. yeah. So, so the what stage is set. The stage is set and we're just the players. And if you follow your script, you're supposed to eat their bad food, get sick. Uh, progressively get worse while you pay all your medical bills and the day your uh, bank account reads zero, you're supposed to die. If I can interject here, um, did you receive a copy, uh, Minnie and Paul, did you receive a copy of the 
um, voir dire questions. Yes, yes, we did. In fact, I have them right here in front of me, and they're shocking. <laughs> we should go through them because I think that really, uh, you know, underlines really that even the government knows uh, yeah. that it's that it that it's corrupt, you know, and and it wants to make sure that nobody on that jury is a, is a, a thinking uh, minded person. Uh, okay, let's talk about some of those. All right. Questions. Okay, well, let's see. So this reads, pursuant to the court's order, the United States submits the following proposed voir dire, am I pronouncing it right? Questions. Yeah. One, do you believe the FDA protects the public health by making sure drugs are safe and effective for their intended uses? If you answer no to that question, uh, you're likely going to get struck from the jury. So, so they're screening for lack of information. If you're, go ahead. All right, well, let's move on to number two. Who here? They're screening for stupidity. Yeah, they're screening for stupidity. Step to the left. Right. <laughs> All right, who here believes that a person who wants to sell a new drug to people as a cure for diseases should get FDA approval first by showing that it is safe and effective? Right, right, and of course, if you if you say no to that, um, you're you're off the jury, and it's a, you know that's a it's a good question, but it presumes that the FDA really uh, passes safe and effect you know they, they, they approve drugs and, and you know as safe and effective that their decision is 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 good, but you can you know look at the sixty thousand people who died from Vioxx, um, whom the FDA the FDA found that to be safe and effective. You know, show me 60,000 people who, who died from using MMS. Right. And I'm sure you can't find any. Well, there's the aspartame. I mean, there's, uh, what's it called? Benzoid dioxide, the thing that's in uh, most sunscreens. Oh, yeah. It's, it's a hormone disruptor, and it's approved by the FDA. Slap oh. it on. What else are they asking? All right, number three. Do you believe that consenting adults should be allowed to buy and sell alternative medicines without interference from the <laughs> FDA? Well, I think probably everyone on the jury will probably raise their hand, but, uh, you know, I think a consenting adult should be allowed to buy and sell anything they want. Um, anyway, that that's just really telling right there. Okay. All right, moving along to question number four. Who thinks that the government cannot be trusted to protect the public health? Me. Me too. <laughs> Me, yeah, that's four of us. <laughs> All right. All right, number five. Do any of you believe that the FDA cares more about drug company profits than the public health? <laughs> wow. Well, it wouldn't take much to put together uh, a bunch of evidence showing that clearly. Yeah, in fact, um, I have a note here, and I'll read it. It's actually from the site, um, which you can get to from standbydaniel.com, and uh, it'll, it'll, it'll go to the GoFundMe site. But um, it says here that uh, the Journal of Law, Medicine, and Ethics, 2013, Volume 14, Number 3, uh, pages 590 through 610, uh, they published that since 1906, heavy commercial influence has compromised legislation to protect the public from unsafe drugs and that the authorization of user fees in 1992, quote, turned drug companies into the FDA's prime clients, deepening the regulatory and cultural capture of this agency. And that's, that's actually in a, um, the, the, the title of that paper is The Institutional Corruption of Pharmaceuticals and the Myth of Safe and Effective Drugs. They, they also said, and this is a pretty prestigious journal, they wrote, unless this corruption of regulatory intent is reversed, the situation will continue to deteriorate. So this is, you know, this is, um, this is Harvard University Center for, for Ethics, and they say that the FDA cannot be trusted, and, and that if we don't, if we don't change... Um, it's only going to get worse. Ch change the, the, the regulation on this because, you know, they have, 
pharmaceutical companies lobbied uh, the Congress to pass laws that, that made it so that if you wanted to get a new drug passed, you had to have the deepest pockets known to man, which, which pharmaceutical companies do. So in other words, to, to I think like a half a billion dollars you would pay to get something uh, officially um, licensed to, to sell it, and that would be for only one drug claim. So if you wanted to say that MMS was an effective antibiotic, um, you know, it costs you that much. Well, nobody, you, anyway. Hey, <laughs> Does the FDA care more about drug company profits than public health? I think the answer is obvious. I think that's so, true, too. Right. I had also heard that the FDA, uh, because of budget cutbacks, really didn't have many facilities to do the experiments needed to prove these things safe. So they had to rely on the people who had these facilities, which are the drug companies. Well, you can be sure that that situation didn't organically develop. That was somehow provoked. They engineered that situation so that that um, intimacy would develop. Right. Also, I've noticed in working with certain uh, natural healing modalities that a healing product like uh, hemp, hemp oil, it has, uh, it cures a lot of things. It's not just one specific thing. The pharmaceutical companies like to have products that cure one thing. Well, actually, they have counter counterindications that show they cause other things too. But uh, they like the one cure, not the multiple cure. Um, applications like uh, the MMS has. Mm-hmm. That's right. And when they when they take a natural substance, they break it into a million pieces and, and then they isolate what they call the active ingredient. And that's really not the way we should be taking these things. It's kind of like saying um, you're destroying the integrity of that plant. That plant comes within a matrix. That plant, you might say, has a spirit. So when you're breaking it down and you're isolating one thing from it, um, that's probably not the healthy. It's like the difference between the Indians, Indians chewing on a coca leaf to keep them from getting altitude sickness and people snorting cocaine. You know, one of them is natural and the other is uh, it's too modified. It's too, un, it's, it's too unnatural to be good for human health. Right. They did the same thing with food. Uh, they've broken it down into components. Uh, the vitamins, the uh, proteins, the so that they could come back and make designer food, so that you right. would consume these things in a really unnatural way, not in combination, you know, like, like you were explaining, Mia. Yeah. Well, look at how many obese people there are eating all of these supposedly designer fo- uh, foods. You know what I mean? Exactly. So, do you want to continue with these? All right, let's move on to number six. Do any of you think that the FDA has blocked public access to effective medicines for improper reasons? (laughs) Don't raise your hand. Don't raise your hand. Not if you want to sit on the jury. That's right. All right, seven. Who agrees with the following statement? Regular vaccinations protect the public against the spread of illnesses and diseases like chicken pox or measles. Well, that's that's amazing. That's the big push. I think that's that's the that's the uh, the major strategy that that MMS can unravel, because I can remember in the beginning of this Ebola scare, the first thing the FDA did is disapprove any product that claimed that they could be effective against Ebola. Yeah. So, uh, you know, if you want people to line up to get these vaccines. You really? oh, I was in Walgreens the other day. I, I, sorry to interrupt you. I, no, go I, ahead. I was, I was in Walgreens, and I, every five minutes, it was, you know, come come to the counter and get your vaccines. We got a two-for-one deal. We got, right. it's, just like, it's like so bizarre. They incentivize the clerks to sell these vaccines. They get, like, transistor radios or whatever whatever the modern equivalent would that would be to persuade people to uh, take the vaccines. Yeah. So, well, have, go ahead. I've been doing some research on the, uh, the clinicals on that. Yeah, because um, I had heard that there have not been 
uh, double-blind clinical studies for either chemotherapy or vaccines. So I started to do some research, and um, it turns out that what they're calling double-blind clinical studies, and this is happening both in the field of chemotherapy and in the field of vaccines, doesn't include uh, a control group that takes a plain placebo. In other words, they're, they're saying um, vaccinated people that are vaccinated for the flu compared to, and then the other group might get the vaccine soup. In other words, it's getting the formaldehyde, it's getting the aluminum, it's getting all the adjuvants and all the dead baby embryo cells and everything else. The only thing it's not getting is one specific antigen. So really the vaccine and the, what they're using as their control vaccine are not really, uh, it's not really a true control. A true control would be you got a vaccine, say, with a regular saline solution. And the same thing is happening in chemotherapy. Uh, when people say there's double-blind clinical studies on chemotherapy, it turns out that uh, they are only comparing this new chemotherapy with that one that we were using. So in other words, if you're involved in one of these studies, you're either going to get their old chemotherapy or their new chemotherapy, and you don't have a control group to compare it to that didn't get chemotherapy. And if you did, and the people that have looked at that analysis, they've actually come out saying that you're better off not treating your cancer than going through their therapies. Yeah, yeah I had heard that it doesn't extend life at all, the chemo. No, and, and say for instance, well, you know, they do that little statistical game where they say, if you live five years, you're a cancer survivor. Well, you know, the deleterious effects of chemo and radiation start showing up at around five years. So a lot of people get secondary cancers because both chemo and radiation are carcinogenic. So your original problem was cancer. You've treated yourself with two cancer producing treatments what do you think is going to happen in five or ten years? You know, your veins get burnt out from carrying the poison. Uh, you end up with edemas. You end up with all sorts of compounding uh, chronic illness. So, you know, you started out with a problem and you end up with a much more complex problem because you've destroyed your immune system. Yeah, so really just it creates more cancer. It, it, it keeps the whole thing going. In the final analysis, the only thing that can get you well is your own immune system. So everything we should focus on is how do we support the immune system. Instead of supporting the pharmaceutical industry. Yes. Right. <laughs> I had heard that the major cause of polio now is polio vaccines. Yeah. If you, if you, well, that, and, who, and that whooping cough. If you start looking at the outbreaks, every time there's an outbreak, when you look a little deeper, it's in the vaccinated population. So right. the vaccines are propagating these diseases. Right. Look at what the, the MMS or the MM, MMR. MMR vaccine. Uh, yep. The, new... the, C, the, the CDC whistleblower. Right. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, there's a furor. You know, I've started uh, tweeting about Daniel's case, and there is a furor online with the mothers uh, of the autistic children who are seeing, you know, because there's a lot of, like, ordinary people that all of a sudden have a kid that gets a vaccine and he's autistic. And so now they're seeing the connection between the CDC's lies and their children and how even the CDC whistleblower is not being reported in the mainstream media. And so a lot of people are waking up. What's the media blackout? How many days are we on? It was like 130, Six, yeah, 123 yeah. days or something like that. Uh, and by the way, we haven't mentioned this, but there's a woman in Mexico, an American woman, Carrie Rivera, who has been very successful uh, working with autistic kids. She started out with the Dan Doctors, you know, the Defeat Autism Now. She didn't really feel that that protocol that they were using was really going, it wasn't effective enough. So she started to incorporate some other things. And one thing that really made a difference was using MMS. And so her protocol includes MMS. And she spoke at one of the big conferences last year. And boy, there was such a furor about that too, you know. So many people want to object to MMS, but it's not on any grounds that they've been damaged or know anybody that's been damaged. It's just because there's a, a 
a ball of propaganda that's getting... They say it's bleach. Yeah. You know. Yeah, the whole bleach argument is uh, splattered all over the internet. You know, it's like saying table salt is bleach because it has uh, the formula NaCl. Well, it's not bleach. Everything that has chlorine in it is not bleach. And the chlorine is its one of the essential things for our survival. Oh, yeah. Well, it, you know, we were talking about uh, ozone and hydrogen, uh, peroxide. Uh, hydrogen peroxide. These are all oxidizing. Even the sun is oxidizing. And so, you know, when you talk about bleach, and, and that's the whole thing about the whole propaganda on the bleach thing, is that uh, if most people, when you say bleach, they go, oh, Clorox, I know what that is. I would never drink that because I saw the label. It says harmful and fatal if swallowed. And um, I can't believe people would be selling this and telling people to, to drink it. Well, interestingly enough, the EPA says, well, if you get in a pinch, you can put eight drops of, uh, of household bleach in your uh, your drinking water to, to purify it in a gallon of drinking water, purify it. And, uh, and they do that, uh, in, uh, all kinds of, uh, countries where they don't have pure water. But, um, the interesting thing is that household bleach does not have any of the same chemicals that's in MMS or even acidified, uh, sodium chloride. And so it's really, it's really a disservice. And when you see people out there, uh, you know, waving the bleach banner, um, as we would say, it's not, it's sort of, it's baseless and it's, it's, they're just trying to prey on people's, um, ignorance, you know, ignorance basically. And, and not, not, I don't mean that in a negative way. It's just that if, if the only bleach I'm familiar with is the one that I've got downstairs by my washing machine that says, uh, um, hateful, you know, fatal or harmful if swallowed. Um, you know, that's going to create a lot of prejudice in my mind if you tell me that, that you know, somebody's telling people to drink that. So, so is it like a uh, ploy by the mainstream media to um, launch these groups that would protest something like this on the grounds that it's too, too close to bleach? I mean, is there, I, I mean, it's bad enough to have to fight the entire government fighting City Hall. But have they created social media or something that are that's also launching? Um... Tell them about that, character. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So, I, um, having done this for several years and, and been involved with uh, the, the technical industry for for more, um, I am familiar with and, and and I'm aware of what are called uh, um, uh, control opposition firms, um, which sort of. Uh, they're in other places of the world, but a lot of them are in the UK. And so a pharmaceutical interest or, or a task force might employ uh, a, an agency as such. And all their job is to sweep the Internet and to create controversy. So uh, anywhere there's something that has to do with a natural health remedy, they come in and they try to undermine it. They, they will. And, and so, for example, there's a guy right now who goes by the name of Haksabja, which is... Um, uh, rot 13 cipher for the name unknown and and so this guy doesn't want to be known he uses throwaway emails every time he posts on a, on a blog or a YouTube channel or at, at, at standbydaniel.com every time he, he, he comes into post or he even did it he even created a PayPal account uh, using one of these throwaway emails so he could send one dollar so that he could send people to his um, his opposition uh, link uh, video that he created that uses a computer generated voice and everything he posts goes through uh, tour servers out of Romania or other places he doesn't do, you, you can't find them they're faceless they're nameless you, you don't see them you don't hear them they but they're these opposition firms and their job is to uh, create controversy uh, so that let's say you're you're reading something that's positive, they're going to balance it the other way, and they're going to tell you how insane you are, how there isn't any double blind placebos, and it's all uh, you know people's stories, and you know how can they be true? And you know we saw that in the Ugandan um, pilot project for for malaria. You can see that link at standbydaniel.com, that the, the video to that pilot project. Um, so yeah, there's there's opposition firms out there. Uh, you know, and I'll tell you the, what, when the government, well, when they, when they 
days after returning the indictment, the Department of Justice released a, uh, a, a press release. You can still read it on their site. It was, it was uh, entitled, Four Charged with Internet Sales of Industrial Bleach as a Miracle Cure. And um, in, in it, they actually refer to us as snake oil salesmen. And, I, and the last time I checked, it's been several months ago, but that, when you put in that title, uh, there was, that article had been plastered all over the world and, to like 15,000 locations. And so the, the government's objective going into this trial is they know that everybody on a jury is for, for two or three weeks on their jury, they still have to check their email, so they still have internet access. They, they, you know, they still have lives to live um, you know, outside of the courtroom. And so and, and they've got family and friends, and they all tweet, and, and they've got cell phones and, and with Facebook and Twitter and things like that. They know that, that if they've littered the airways with, with uh, the propaganda, that... Um, they're going to come in contact with it somehow, some way. Somebody's going to say, yeah, the, you know, to a husband and wife or, or someone in their family, the case is about X. They know human nature. And so their objective is to taint the jury pool from day one. And so the second the indictment was filed, they, they, they put that mass media release out there. And, and one of the journalists, editors down in Ashland, actually in Medford, um, picked it up and immediately went to work um, filing, uh, not filing, I'm sorry, um, publishing numerous article after article after article, just parroting the government. And then, um, and then we got up here to Spokane, and, and there was a, a, a Washington, D.C. correspondent who worked for the Spokesman Review who uh, published an article just parroting the same stuff. I mean, it was, it's ridiculous. It's, it's full of, you know, things that aren't even true about the case. Um, and its purpose is to taint the jury pool. And anyway, so that's the answer to your question, <laughs> the, the long answer. Right, not just the jury pool. I know that uh, uh, in exposing false flags, um, when you publish a video that exposes something like that, you're going to have, uh, I don't know what you call them, sock puppet software or uh, oh, uh, yeah, mechanical yeah, responses. Actually, we were uh, having dinner with somebody last night, and she was. Uh, we were talking about people waking up around the world. And she was saying uh, that she's finding that the people seem to be less aware of the Ebola hoax now than they were three months ago when you know it was in when people were really finding out what was going on and how she knew that was or how she thought that what she was basing her reasoning on was that she was reading the comments to videos about ebola now she sees that there's an overwhelming number of people that are terrified by it and on and on and on I think what she was reading was responses put there by these advertising firms, these uh, PR firms. Yeah, and, yeah, controlled uh, opposition firms, yeah. Yeah, it was controlled opposition. So now, I mean, it's really hard to gauge anything because of, with social media, even I'm even calling YouTube a social media, uh, because there's so much infiltration by government agents working through these PR firms. It's horrible. Yeah. Yeah, because once I think once the government realized how you know the internet could be their undoing, they you know they basically formed a, a counter answer to that, and it's to the point now where you you cannot you could not make an edit that's even remotely middle of the road on on, on Wikipedia on the entry for say MMS or, or or other ones for that. If you get into anything controversial. All of those uh, articles are basically, we'll say, the, we'll use the word owned, but they're, they're controlled by admins who have developed um, uh, the credentials to basically, if they don't, if you come in, you know, as you know, Wikipedia 
can be edited by anyone. You can go on right now and edit any article. Well, whoever's been overseeing and sort of babying that article as life, you know, as its life goes on, um, if they don't like what you've added to the article or modified to the article, they're going to come and they're going to remove your post. And then if you try and do it again, then they're going to report you. And then they're and, and, and they report to somebody else. And so so basically, the government has sort of taken over Wiki to control all of the dialogue on Wikipedia that's on any controversial topic. Right, exactly. So, yeah, so you can't you, you can't trust Wikipedia to get to get any truthful answer about anything that's controversial. That's for sure. Yeah, we have a friend who uh, he's well enough and well enough known to have an entry on Wikipedia, but they've slandered him so much on that media that he has to have. A, uh, what is it? it's an item that appears v right above or below the Wikipedia item, uh, straightening out the misinformation that Wikipedia is putting out about him. He's a controversial guy, but you know, sure, that's how sure. they work. Well, yeah, you, know, you try and go and you know tell the truth about any any mainstream media news anchor, and uh, it'll even get taken down. It just exactly. It's all Exactly. YouTube, they'll take down your whole channel. We've yeah. run into that. Not us personally, but other people that we watch. You know, if they yeah, put red some... Red Ice, huh? Red Ice, yeah. They took down their ability to... Right. right. There was a, a, a week... I don't want to get too off the topic, but a couple of weeks ago, um, in line with the anniversary of the Sandy Hook hoax... Um, there was an amazing documentary put together by independent filmmakers. It was yeah. called uh, We Need to Talk About Sandy Hook. Right. And it was, do, do you know about that? Yeah, I watched it. It was the most censored video ever. I mean, they went crazy trying to get that off. I lost a computer trying to get, trying to watch it. It's, uh, it's amazing what they'll, the, the links that they'll go through to maintain people in this reality. Yeah. yeah. Do, you want, do you want to go with another? Would you like me to read more of the uh, yeah, let's juror go. elimination sure, let's questions? More, yeah. All right, let's see. So we have, who here believes that children should not be required to get vaccinated in order to attend public school? All right. All right if you're... Uh, what does that have to do with MMS, I wonder? Right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Does anyone here think that the government should not put fluoride in our drinking water? <laughs> oh, you mean fluoride, the poison? Right. The rat poison? The, the Harvard, right. studies, Harvard studies have shown reduces, if you drink it for 10 years, right. it reduces your IQ 20 points. Yeah. Who needs those? Who needs, I think, you know, who needs those 20 points? We, we want Kids fluoride are... drinkers on the jury. That's right. <laughs> too damn smart nowadays anyway, right? That's right. <laughs> right. The whole, the whole point is to keep everyone stupid. All right. Let, yeah. Moving along. Would you have difficulty finding a person guilty if she broke the law because she thought the law was wrong? Well, isn't, yeah. that, isn't that a responsibility? Don't. Now, I, I'm not a lawyer either. Far from it. But it seems to me I heard that the, the juries have two responsibilities. One, findings, finding someone guilty or not guilty, and then also uh, throwing out laws that are so bogus that they shouldn't be there in the first place. Isn't that part of a jury's... Uh, uh, well, I should send you another brief the government wrote. It, it, they filed a motion in limine to preclude any... Um, jury nullification argument at trial, and in it, it's interesting because the government says it's a fact that the government, the, the, the jury, I'm sorry, that the jury can nullify the law. It is a fact. It's just one of those things that we have to live with and deal with. But we're we're asking the court to basically um, limit any discussion of jury nullification. And of course, the judge went along with it and said, "Yeah, um, the, you know, the jury doesn't." You don't have to give a jury instru a, a jury nullification instruction. They're not required to do so. So, in other words, if you are educated enough to know about jury nullification, that's great. But most people aren't, and so they're going to try and weed anybody out that might be. 
But yeah, you're right that they have the right to do that. But the court and the government, it's part of stacking the, the you know, having the cards stacked against you is they don't want anybody on that jury that knows about it. They don't want you to talk about it during trial. Amazing. It's but like... on another note, though, on that, you, to, that goes towards the question. There's a thing called a duty of care. Um, if somebody's life was in danger, would you would you not offer them something because offering them some you know, uh, offering them something would be illegal? You know, what about the duty of care? You know, you let somebody die because it would be illegal to help them. Right. That sounds like the uh, the 90 year old man in Florida being arrested for feeding the homeless. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. How can yeah, that be? Really twisted. Mm -hmm. Very twisted. You want to go ahead? Well, here's the last one. Would any of you have difficulty finding someone guilty if she committed a crime because she believed she was helping people? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So you, they don't want compassionate people on the. the no, jury. so you can't be informed, you can't be compassionate. Um, and you have to really love your poisons like fluoride, vaccines, <laughs> right. aspartame. And trust your government's uh, agencies to protect you against everything. So I feel really, really safe, don't you? <laughs> Jeez. And, and everybody... So that the government can only get rid of three people uh, in all of those questions, so... Well, that is a saving grace because they're ridiculous. Well, how many, how many people, I mean, is a jury pool uh, uh, X amount and then they have to pick from that pool? Or, I mean, how does that work? Do you know? Uh, well, there's a, it'll be a jury of 12. And, um, you know, I'm not really familiar with the whole process yet. I will be um, as the day approaches. But... Um, you know, the first day they'll they'll go through voir dire, and they'll they'll try to they'll bring in a, a pool and and you know they'll ask people to, to step down that they they've uh, deemed would be biased towards their case, and uh, yeah, but it'll be a jury of twelve. Well, I I would think that this is a uh... I mean, I think they're trying to make an example out of you. And if you were to you were to prevail in this case, it would probably mean something for all of us. It would probably mean uh, maybe weakening the, uh, the the arm of the FDA or something. What what does this mean in the greater in the greater perspective, Mia, Dan? Sure. I... Um, well, from from the you know, we'll look at the MMS perspective. Obviously, if they get a precedent that um, establishes sodium chloride, something that's been you know available and sold um, and, and generally generally recognized as safe in the United States for eighty plus years, if they get that established as a drug, they're they're going to use that uh, as a launching point not just in the United States, but worldwide. I mean, they've, the FDA has tentacles everywhere. I mean, they sent the FDA in Dominican Republic to the Genesis 2 Church. Um, I have a, a copy of that report in Discovery. Um, they, you know, they're, they get on the phone with these, these sister agencies in every country. So um, they really everyone's kind of looking towards the U.S. To, to see, you know, well, what does the FDA want to do here? And so... If they get uh, a, a ruling in this case that establishes sodium chloride as a quote quote drug, or we should say MMS, they're going to go against everyone that's selling it. It's going to be um, it's, it's, there's going to be a prohibition on, on MMS sodium chloride solution for that that purpose. Um, big, uh, you know, on the big side of things. Uh, you, any time uh, the government comes against a health freedom, um, you know we're we're all losing. Um, you know, maybe you want to jump in here, Mia. Um, uh, you know, it's 
it wouldn't really matter if we were we were dealing with uh, um, you know vitamin C or, or uh, you know whatever it is that they would be attacking. It doesn't matter because it it all affects the natural health freedom uh, that that we all you know are trying to get back that was you know taken from us. You know I love uh, Benjamin Rush. Let's let's talk about Benjamin Rush for a second. Oh, was it Benjamin Rush? Yeah. Um, he. Uh, uh, can, can I read something from this is a, from an attorney Nancy Lord? Yes, please. She argued, yep, she argued in closing arguments um, uh, the Roger Sless trial in New Mexico. Uh, it's been uh, some years now, but she she said this. She said the idea of the government control of medicine occurred to two people: Benjamin Rush, George Washington's personal doctor and a signer of the Declaration of Independence, and Thomas Jefferson. Benjamin Rush warned, "Quote." Unless we put medical freedom into the Constitution, the time will come when medicine will organize into an undercover dictatorship. To restrict the art of healing to one class of men and deny equal privileges to others will constitute the bestill of medical science. All such laws are un-American and despotic and have no place in a republic. The constitution of this republic should make special privilege for medical freedom as well as religious freedom. And then uh, uh, Nancy Lord continued, she said, The founders guaranteed that we would remain free of government interference in our choice of religion. When the founders wrote the constitution and the Bill of Rights, they knew the government would try to dictate religion because it always had. But in spite of Dr. Rush's prophetic warning, the right to freedom in our choice of health care is not part of the Bill of Rights. And, boy, we've sure seen that rear its head uh, with Obamacare. The founders never imagined that a trial such as this would ever take place in America because they never thought the federal government would ever attempt to control what we keep in our medicine cabinets and kitchen cabinets. And, and I'll tell you, when they, when they raided our home, they went through, they took MMS out of the the. the the uh, bathroom, because we use it in every room. There's, there's a thousand uses that have nothing to do with with therapeutic um, aspects, and we had it in, in I don't know three or four different rooms in our house. And they took every bottle from every room. And here, uh, the, the the founders never thought the federal government would ever attempt to control what we keep in our medicine cabinets and kitchen cabinets. There was no such thing as the FDA until 1906, when the Pure Food and Drug Act. Uh, permitted the government to seize dangerous substances. Then in 1938, they required that safety data be submitted for evaluation. In 1962, all of those products and any new new ones ha had to submit data on effectiveness and wait until the FDA approved the drug before it could be marketed. So, you know, we had, we had uh, Dr. Rush tell us, look, you've got to put this into the Constitution because if you don't, it's going to get taken away. And, and boy, wasn't that prophetic. So you ask sort of what is the big picture of, of, of this and the end result of this. It's really it's one more step. And, it, and if, if we could win this case, uh, um, well, I, there's too much that I, I, I could say that I shouldn't say because it has to do with trial strategy and, and um, uh more to that effect. So I'll, I'll, I'll end there, but I think Mia wants to say something. Well, the immediate effect would be it would put at risk all the uh, resellers of MMS. And, it, you know, it, it's so strange because here Daniel's uh, got his back against the wall and all this MMS baloney going on. But if you go to eBay or you go to Amazon or you go to Google, you can buy MMS now. It has never been illegal. It has never been unavailable. And so the immediate effect of this trial would be that they would start systematically trying to take down those people one after another. Don't you think, Daniel? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah all the, even the attorneys yeah. agree with that. Yeah. Um, because they know that you can cure malaria. You know, just, just let's just take three big ones. They got a group of people working with MMS in Sierra Leone that's having excellent success with Ebola. Uh, they had um, a Red Cross sponsored trial in Africa where 154 people who were verified positive with malaria, boom, in 48 hours, 100% of them are cured from malaria. 
Um, and once HQ, you know, Red Cross got a hold of that, they disclaimed it, but you can't deny the video. I mean, it's... It's, it's, it's their video. Yeah. Um, so, you know, they, they don't... It's too, it's, too, it's too easy to cure all these incurable diseases. There's your problem right there. You know, once people start doing DIY, you know, do-it-yourself medicine, this is why they're so against us doing this um, home remedy stuff is because, like Jim Humble said, um, there isn't a cure for cancer. There's a hundred cures for cancer. When he gave seminars, he would say, you know, I, I discovered that this particular chemical, the sodium chloride, does these things, and he made a whole list, and he said, but you know something? This one, and this other one, and this other one, things that we've never heard of. Um, he said, these all have antibacterial uh, disinfecting properties. These all have potential. So what we have is um, the systematic suppression of cheap, non-toxic, that potentially widely available things. I mean, just in your own cupboard, you know, you've got the baking soda, you've got the vinegar, you've got the hydrogen peroxide, and you know, just starting out with small things like that, you can make a big impact on somebody's health. You know, so so yeah. I mean, they want to continue to um, disempower us regarding taking charge of our own health and doing it in a um, in an economical way. Right. This whole assault seems to correspond with the invention of allopathic medicine. Mm-hmm. You know, around well, the turn of the century. Was Good. Behind it, wasn't he? And Rockefeller always said, competition is a crime. No, it's a sin. Competition is a sin. That was one of the things that Rockefeller used to say. Right, and when he started the allopathic movement by fi- only financing medical schools that would teach his new allopathic medicine techniques, but he died with his homeopathic doctor by his side, coincidentally. Uh, <laughs> so maybe he, his homeopathic doctor poisoned him on purpose. I, well, rid- we can only hope, but... <laughs> yeah, it sounds like... Um, it sounds like it's part of a much larger agenda, uh, shutting down of uh, medical op- alternatives. Uh, and as you said, uh, M- MMS or uh, sodium chloride is being patented now, didn't you say, by the drug companies? Yeah. Oh, yeah, they're, they're running clinical trials on it for everything. Oh, God, Parkinson's, uh, Lou Gehrig's, uh, HIV, uh, yeah. I mean, just... The dentists use it extensively. There's products that have it uh, in dentistry because it's fantastic for um, like post-surgical and stuff like that for keeping the mouth clean. You know, it does. It doesn't. You know, we say again, it doesn't doesn't cure disease. Um, that's a funny thing to say, anyway. Um, it it kills pathogens. It happens to do it um, outside the body and and inside the body, and. There are so many uses for MMS. Uh, you know, there's a list of them. StandbyDaniel.com. You could there. There are just. It's amazing how many things you can use MMS for that will, will make your life better. You know, that, that don't even have anything to do with therapy. You know, or, or, or quote quote curing a disease. Mm-hmm. And I can't think that it's a coincidence that the timing of this happens to coincide with their big Ebola card. That I mean, I, if this has has is been shown to have great effects in treating Ebola, and they want Ebola to scare everyone they want you to take into the taking the vaccine, so they can't be having something that anyone can get easily that would cure it, then they wouldn't take their vaccine, which of course. Isn't it funny that right away they had their uh, people trying that ZMAP drug? Remember ZMAP, this ZMAP, that it hadn't been approved. It was an experimental thing, but man, they shoved them right into the ZMAP. But then when people have tried to help with Ebola, um, they're they're accusing people of getting poisoned and so on and so forth. It's like there's um, it's it's just it's an organized campaign. And as we've talked about, they, you know, they have their goal, and it's, it's to make sure that this, that the Ebola fuse has to catch for them to continue with their strategy here. Right, exactly. 
So they have to do everything possible to ensure that the pharmaceutical companies, whether it's GlaxoSmithKline or the, the, the makers of ZMAT, uh, make maximum profit. So they're, yeah. they're willing to do anything to ensure... But it's obvious that the vaccines are more important than the treatment in this one, because I think if you sniff around a little bit, it looks like the, the transmission method is going to be by vaccine. I think that, well, my own non-medical opinion is that it's always been by vaccine. But, yeah. But that's just me. Yeah. So, yeah. So, well, let's talk about you, Daniel, personally, and what's at stake here. I mean, your family's been completely violated. I mean, there's been so much violence against you and your family and your um, employees who were also indicted. So... How will this all un unroll for you, and what you know? What can the people listening do to help you? And where can we yeah, all why, play why, a role? What can we do? What can we do to get behind you? Well, thank you for asking that. And, and we created a site, uh, StandbyDaniel.com. Um, some good friends helped put that together, and uh, that will forward to a GoFundMe site where you can. Um, read more about the story, get a lot of information, a lot of updates, because we really haven't published anything for since the arrest because, um, well, my friends and family were all involved and I didn't want retaliation um, from the government. So I just kind of kept quiet and tried to figure out how to approach all this. But uh, now that they don't have to go to trial and they've pled out on, on misdemeanors, um, I'm a little bit more free to, to be more vocal. So we've there's a lot of information there. You can you can read about it, um, but you can give, and that's really the biggest thing that that we need right now is contributions to go towards the defense fund. Uh, we have trial right now; it's scheduled in 62 days, and we have s some pretty serious legal needs to to get us on the other end of it. We we have been told that our case is winnable, and uh, we we plan to win. So. So if they go to standbydaniel.com, and that's probably all in lowercase? doesn't matter. Okay, and then they can get to you on... When we post this, we'll put that, that link below. Um, so, sure. So what they can do is they can go, go to that site, read more specifics on the case, and probably uh, on MMS, and know how to get in touch with you and send you aid if they're if they're poss if it's possible for them mm -hmm. yeah any and anything is uh anything and, and if you know this these are hard times and if people don't have uh, money to give um one of the other things that's really helpful is to 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 repost it to put it on facebook to tweet it um if there's anybody out there that wants to do translations we have french and spanish uh, and obviously English, but um, other translations. Um, we've received permission from GoFundMe to put up uh, the same campaign in multiple languages. Um, so if we, if there was anybody that could um, contribute towards that, um, and just post articles and blog and get this thing linked out, um, that's that would be a big help as well. Great. It is. It is a worldwide situation, and as you said before. The uh, outcome of this trial could affect everybody worldwide and take away our ability to self-medicate. Um, we do yeah. a lot. Yeah. Yes. Self, self cleanse. Self cleanse. Self cleanse, right. take care of our own health, heal ourselves, because if we, we can't put ourselves in the hands of the Western medical establishment anymore, we can't trust them to take care of us, to heal us, and not make us worse than we were when we started and when we went to them. And yeah. one by one, we're losing so many of our freedoms and rights to be... Um, right, but I think we're on a positive timeline now. I think that things are going to happen in our favor, and we can make one of these things happen in our favor if we can contribute to your cause and stand behind you on this. Uh, you know, you uh, unwittingly, unwillingly, 
are in the forefront of this fight, and the yeah. least we can do is fall in behind you and and support you in this because it means a lot to everybody. Thank you, Paul and Mindy. Thank, thank you very much for hosting us on this show too, because um, you know da uh, Daniel wondered whether or not he should start to do shows, and I think it's important to 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 talk to people about this because. Um, it's not just uh, FDA, uh, Daniel. It's big. It's global right now. There are obviously um, there. It's a multi-front attack that we're under, health-wise, and we need to resurrect old home remedies and um, uh, hang on to these uh, non-toxic, wide-spectrum things that we can. Um, get a hold of, like the MMS, remember it's good for a long time, so you can have MMS on your shelf and one bottle will cure a lot of ills, you could probably cure your whole neighborhood of one thing or another with it, um, but the, the what, what we're facing right now uh, is very important, very global, and we have to have resources, you know, resources like this uh, to stay alive and help other people stay alive. Right. Very it is good. a full frontal attack on humanity because, you know, I mean, it's clear that the controllers want a much smaller population and they want us to die. They want us to be ill and not be able to cure ourselves. And there is so much at stake for, for the survival of the human race, really. Yep. So your fight is just uh, emblematic of the fight we're all facing right now, that we all need to come together and stand up for our rights and protect each other and ourselves That's from great. this onslaught. Is there anything, uh, as we wind this down, is there anything you'd like to say uh, at the end here? I think we all know your situation. Well, um... I will tell you that we, we do get every email, um, every encouraging word, and those are those mean the world to me. Um, this has been a, a battle that I'll tell you has tested us, uh, you know, beyond words could say. Um, some days it's hard to get out of bed uh, when you're looking at, you know, a potential 37 years and a system as corrupt as it is, you wonder if you will truly have a fair day in court. And that's really what we're trying to do is to raise the funds to ensure that. Um, I've been representing myself pro se, and, and we know that doesn't work very well. Um, there's a systematic discrimination against pro se defendants in the, in, in the court system. So anyway, I, you know, I would just say, you know, thank you for all the encouraging words that, that everybody sends. Uh, it means a lot. Okay, well, thank you very much for spending this time with us. Thank you, Mia, for being there uh, with and for Daniel. And uh, She's a wonderful friend. Isn't she something? Oh, yes. Yeah. It's my pleasure to be here. Okay, so thank you very much. Uh, let's end this little... Uh, this little interview and uh, lots of luck we'll be doing what we can here and uh, and we'll get the word out and anyone who's listening that would like to maybe talk to Daniel further perhaps you can contact him and and get his word out to as many people as we possibly can yes all my contact info is on the on the site standbydaniel.com all right wonderful okay. Well, best of luck to you, Daniel and Mia, and uh, thank you so much for joining us on The World Beyond Belief. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Happy New Year. Same yeah. to you.